now the latest from ITV News Anglia with Becky Jago and David Whiteley. Good evening, welcome to ITV News Anglia. Here are tonight's main stories for you. As the shoplifting epidemic plagues our high streets and supermarkets, we talk to the police chief determined not to turn a blind eye. This crime is meaning that you and I are paying more for our food and drink every week. As six become five, who's still in the running to become the next Conservative Party leader? Keeping mum about male postnatal depression calls for better mental health support for new dads. I did keep him a little bit at arm's length because I was scared that something horrible would happen to him. And how a fundraising appeal led to a peal of bells ringing out across a Suffolk village once more. Hello from David and from me, welcome to the programme. First tonight, the crime that's leaving us all out of pocket. Between March 2023 and March this year, there were nearly 40,000 shoplifting offences recorded in the east of England. That's up 22% on the year before. Suffolk saw the lowest increase with just 6%. Essex saw an increase of 21%, whereas Cambridgeshire rose by 30%. Well, police say it means we're all paying more for our food and drink as a result of the gangs targeting stores. But with only around a third of the criminals ever charged, just what can be done to combat it? Well, Andy Ward has been speaking to Norfolk Police to find out. It's been described as the epidemic that's rocking the world of retail. Stores like this one in Kings Lynn targeted by shameless shoplifters. It's why police in Norfolk say enough is enough. A greater proportion of shoplifters are charged here than anywhere else in the country, with the force charging people in more than 31% of cases. This crime is meaning that you and I are paying more for our, for our food and drink every week, so it's important that there's a robust policing response. You're charging around a third of, of shoplifters, aren't you? But the simple maths means that means you're not charging two thirds, so that's still not great, is it? Uh, no, we're doing very well. We're, we are charging a third, but on top of that, there are, there are other means of prosecuting individuals, whether it be through cautions, whether it be through summonses. In total, 46% of the people who commit shoplifting in this county uh, uh, get, get caught for it. and That's the highest in the country. Um, and I think if you're going out and committing crime and there's a near 50% chance you're going to get caught, I think that that's a good deterrent. Well, Lee, this is the alcohol aisle, of course. Is this the sort of item that people are targeting? Yeah, alcohol is very desirable. But despite that deterrent, this is a battle that's still very much ongoing. At the East of England Co-op, security measures have been stepped up in a bid to protect staff, with workers now equipped with body cameras and given access to panic alarms. And this is a crime that's on the rise. Figures from the National Office of Statistics show that there were nearly 5,000 shoplifting offences recorded by Norfolk Police last year, a 30% increase on the previous year. And that was also the highest figure since police records began nearly 20 years ago, making it a really worrying time for places like this. An increase that bosses here say won't be tolerated. We have got a dedicated security service within the department that will come out and we, you know, we will identify you with the police and we will seek the punishment that fits the crime. So this year so far we've already got over 500 weeks of custodial sentences in Norfolk. So we're working really closely with Norfolk Police now and their, and their business crime team to really push that forward. For many businesses though, tougher sanctions can't come soon enough. More than £1,000 worth of stock was recently stolen from this bookstore in Norwich. The kind of cost independent shops like this say they just can't afford. We're just a family. Um, I don't have the ability to, uh, you know, to absorb those costs, you know, because we don't have a, a giant company over us. The government is promising a stronger police response, even to so-called low value thefts of under £200. A clear message to offenders that if you're thinking of committing this callous crime, you better be prepared for the consequences. Andy Wards, ITV News. 
Some more of your day's news now. And police investigating the murder of a mum of six who suffered serious head injuries while walking her dog in Suffolk have identified two people they want to speak to. Anita Rose, who was 57, was found unconscious on a footpath in Brantham in July. She died four days later. Detectives have reviewed over 100 hours of CCTV footage and have now released images of two people who might be able to help them with their investigation. There have previously been three arrests in connection with the inquiry. A Suffolk manufacturer which supplied cladding insulation boards for the Grenfell Tower, which was destroyed by fire seven years ago, has received heavy criticism in a high-profile inquiry into the disaster. The fire in the tower block killed 72 people and the inquiry's conclusion into the fire was published today. Celotex, which has a factory in Hadley, was criticised as embarking on a dishonest scheme to mislead its customers through its testing process. The company said it had improved its quality control system. A 47-year-old mother died after receiving too much anaesthetic during an operation at a private hospital in Cambridge, an inquest has found. Dr Rachel Gibson, who had severe osteoarthritis, had hip replacement surgery at the Spire Lee Hospital in April 2022. The coroner said she suffered a cardiac arrest after being given an anaesthetic in excess of the recommended dose. She died three months later. Members of an organised crime gang based near Kings Lynn have been jailed. Calvin Newson, who's 38 and from Hillington, was identified as one of the ringleaders of the operation, which supplied cocaine and cannabis. He's been sentenced to 13 years. Three other accomplices have also been jailed after pleading guilty to drugs offences. A Suffolk primary school and nursery remained shut today on the first day of the new term after a small fire broke out on the roof. More than 400 children were unable to attend the Beaches Community Primary in Ipswich after a solar panel caught fire last night. No major damage was caused, but it was decided to keep the school shut for safety precautions. The two co-head teachers said the school will reopen tomorrow and thank neighbours for spotting the fire quickly. We're really thankful to obviously our members of the community yeah. that have um, kept our school safe in this instance and obviously their quick response to contact the emergency services um, and many of our local community are also parents and obviously mm. pupil safety is paramount and that will always come first. Mm -hmm. um, our parents know that, that's part of being a school. Next tonight, Whitam MP Priti Patel has become the first candidate to be knocked out of the Conservative leadership race. Tory MPs voted today in the first round of the contest to replace Rishi Sunak. Five candidates remain in the running, including Essex MPs Kemi Badenock and James Cleverley. Where else to go now? But Westminster, live in our political correspondent, Emma Hutchinson. Emma, good evening. Uh, well, it's a close fought contest, isn't it? Yes, it is. Remember, there are only 121 Conservative MPs after that general election defeat two months ago. So this is a pretty small electorate choosing who they want as their next leader in this first stage of the contest. So we started out this morning with six candidates in the race, and this is how it looked after Conservative MPs had voted in that first round. Rob Jenrick topping the poll. He's a former immigration minister. He got 28 votes. In second place, North West Essex MP Kemi Badenoch with 22 votes. And then just one vote behind her, another Essex MP, Braintree MP James Cleverley. Then the former security minister, Tom Tugan, had 17 votes. Mel Stride with 16. And then in last place with just 14 votes, but only two behind, another Essex MP, Whitam MP, Priti Patel. So she is now eliminated from this contest. She put out a message on social media this afternoon saying that she's very much enjoyed the summer, going out and about, meeting Conservative Party members across the country. She wished her colleagues the best of luck with the rest of the contest. Two of those colleagues from Essex are still in the race, of course, Kemi Badenoch. She, in second place, is one of the favourites to win this race. And also the Braintree MP, James Cleverley, of course, the former Home Secretary, former Foreign Secretary. And one Norfolk MP said to me that whoever wins this race, they're going to have a big task to gain more support for the party. We've been unceremoniously thrown out of office and this isn't an election for a Prime Minister, as we've had in the past. This is an election for somebody to rebuild the Conservative Party. So uh, very close, very small numbers. And the truth is, somehow through this process, the Conservative Party has got to build a team. Uh, and Emma, this is a long process, isn't it? 
Yes, it absolutely is. We won't find out who the next leader of the Conservative Party is. Of course, Rishi Sunak is still, until that day, the leader, but until the 2nd of November. So we've got more rounds of voting amongst MPs here at Westminster. They will whittle that list down to just two names, and then those two names will be put to the Conservative Party membership across the country. Of course, many of those members live across the east of England, live in our region, and they will get the final say, and then we'll get the announcement of the new leader, as said, at the start of November. Quite a few weeks to go yet, Emma. Many thanks indeed. Right, thanks for your company this evening. It is ten past six. Still to come. Yep. Ellie Chalice, the Paralympic swimmer from Essex, tells us what inspired her to become a gold medal winner in Paris. Plus, a new era beckons for the country church, which hasn't rung a full peal of its bells for more than 100 years. And some warm and humid weather on the way. I'll have all the details coming up shortly. Summer's clinging on. Uh, next tonight, the campaign to better recognise the impact of having a baby on a dad's mental health. One in ten men will be diagnosed with postnatal depression in the first year after having a baby. Yet often the resources and support groups are targeted at women. Yeah, it's led to calls for clinical guidelines to be updated to make sure that men also get screened for the condition, as Catherine Walker reports. So the lowest point was when... Um, I was in the car um, and fully intended on, uh, on taking my own life. Oh, and what's this? With new responsibilities and sleepless nights, <laughs> becoming a father can be challenging. But for some men like Luke, it can also trigger mental health problems. I did all of those things. Yes, I changed his, his nappy and all that and fed him. But I did keep him a little bit at arm's length because I was scared that something horrible would happen to him and I ended up shouting at my older two children over um, the minorest of things mm. and you'd be sat in bed that night thinking why did I do that and you couldn't I wouldn't put my finger on that it was because I was upset or because I was depressed. The latest figures show that one in ten dads will be diagnosed with postnatal depression in the year after their baby is born. But many of the resources used to diagnose and treat the condition, including clinical guidelines, are targeted at women. In Chelmsford, these dads say it's time there was more support for new fathers. I did receive some support from, from friends that have gone through a similar experience and I now offer that support to my friends that are going through it as well. I've never actually been approached or asked if I ever need support, so it's... I would say it's pretty key for, for young men. For me, that was definitely not needed. I mean, I didn't uh, need any, any support because, um, I mean, my, my attitude to this, let's call it, event was like I was really enjoying it. So, but maybe, maybe for some of the dads, it's a bit stressful. So, Dan, tell us about the outreach this morning. Some help is available through the services of non-profits like Dad Matters. They work with parents and professionals across the country to raise awareness of postpartum depression in men. But Manager Kieran says there's only so much they can do without a national strategy. I think routine screening would really help us to understand more about the, the, the bigger picture for dads um, and also the impact on their partners and their babies. I think one of the biggest issues is that dads feel like it's a woman-only issue. Uh, but we really do need to think more about having a, a whole approach across the country so that a dad who has a child under two can access the mental health support they need to be the dad that their baby needs. My finger. Oh. Back home with his son, Luke is proof yeah. that the right diagnosis and treatment can help dads thrive. He now supports other men with postnatal <laughs> depression and hopes eventually that all new parents will be screened for the condition. Catherine Walker, ITV News. Well, in a statement, the Department of Health and Social Care said people with mental health issues are not getting the support or care they deserve, which is why we will fix the broken system to ensure we give mental health the same attention and focus as physical health. This will include improving the help available to women giving birth and their partners. And we will also recruit 8,500 more mental health workers to cut weights for treatment. Well, to tell us more about some of the signs, symptoms and the support that's available for men with postnatal depression, uh, we're joined by Dr Livia Martucci from the Royal College of Psychiatrists. 
Uh, Dr Martucci, tell us um, more about some of the symptoms of postnatal depression in men and also who is most at risk? Postnatal depression for men might mean that um, a man might not feel that he's a good enough father or even a good enough partner um, if, if he's in a relationship um, and it can be a terrible uh, feeling to have. And uh, while this can happen to any man um, and any father, uh, there's some indication in the literature to show that new fathers may be more at risk. And it is uh, very much still seen as uh, untreated as a female issue instead of just a, a new parent issue. Why is this, do you think? The, um, the emphasis uh, has been on um, mothers historically and more recently also thinking of birthing parents, uh, largely because of the major biological changes that um, uh, pregnancy um, causes and uh, also because often it is the mother or the birthing parent that will be the primary caregiver. But as time has passed and more awareness has been raised on perinatal mental disorders, there's a greater understanding and recognition that these um, affect also um, um, fathers. And the important message uh, today, if anyone is watching uh, and you think you might have it or someone you know has it, is that there is something you can do about it, isn't it? Absolutely, yes. So the most important thing to do is to not ignore it. If you think or um, someone close to you thinks um, that you're not well, the first thing to do is to seek help. Um, the first port of call can be uh, your doctor, your GP, who can signpost you to uh, psychological services in primary care who are very, very well established in dealing with depression and anxiety. If you already have a psychiatric service, go talk to them because they can also modify their treatment plan, your treatment plan with them. Uh, so there, is, there are resources, there is help out there that can be accessed. Dr. Martucci, thank you very much for your time today. My pleasure. Yeah, that's some great advice there. It's a daunting time, whether you're the mum or the dad. It's, uh, yeah, it can it be really, a blur as well. It's always a blur. It right? never changes. Always. It never changes. Right, the Paralympics now, and Suffolk swimmer William Ellard was in action a little earlier. He was swimming in lane two of the 200 metres individual medley S14 final, but couldn't add to his medal haul of two golds and a silver. Coming in fifth, teammate Rhys Darby took silver. William, who's 18, and from Beckles, still has another chance to reach the podium, though, when he competes in the backstroke on Friday. Also in the hunt for medals, Norfolk wheelchair tennis star Alfie Hewitt, already in the semis of the singles. The world number one is currently playing in the semis of the doubles with partner Gordon Reid. The Brits leading their French opponents 4-2 in the first set. The latest score there. And in para powerlifting, Ipswich weightlifter Zoe Newson won silver in the women's 45k final. Her lift of 109 kilograms enough for second place. The 32-year-old missed out on a medal in Tokyo. Well, from one Paralympic medalist to another now, Ellie Chalice, the 20-year-old from Clacton who learned to swim in Colchester, has won the 50 metres backstroke at the Paralympic Games in Paris. Yeah, Ellie, who had her limbs amputated after getting meningitis as a child, says she was inspired to take up the sport after watching the Paralympics in London 2012. It's generally the most thing ever. I don't think it's going to sink in and I don't think it will for a long time. You know, 12 years ago, I was sitting at London 2012 watching the athletics on the 4th of September. And to be here 12 years later at my second Paralympic Games with a Paralympic gold medal is just insane. Oh, isn't it fantastic? Unlike Tokyo, Ellie had her own cheer squad at the race and plenty of support back home. I'm, I'm so thankful that I'm, I'm in this position to make awareness for meningitis and to hopefully make a difference um, in life. And, you know, I've, I've been supported all my life from the doctors that saved my life. I know they were watching. They had my T-shirts on. I've got the pictures. Fantastic. Well, her day was made extra special by seeing her teammate and best friend, Louise Fiddes, also taking gold just minutes later. 
I know she nearly cried in the call room for her race because of what I did and she's such a special friend to me. Um, I then got my media done, I was in the media zone watching her screaming at the TV at her race. In the last five metres I started bawling my eyes out, I fell on the floor, found her the first chance I could get and we just sat on the floor, had the biggest hug and was like, what have we just done? <laughs> <laughs> oh, lovely. Well, that wasn't the only familiar friend she had. She actually paid tribute to the scooter she used to make her entrance to the pool. I love my Whirly. You know, I've had that thing for 18 years, the same one. He's been on holidays and he's been to every competition I've ever done. I really, like, I couldn't imagine another way of coming out for a race. Brilliant. <laughs> Good old Whirly. Hey, absolutely. Doesn't go anywhere without mm. her. Uh, right, the ITV News is after us. Here's Mary. Coming up in the ITV Evening News, all 72 lives lost could have been avoided as the Grenfell Inquiry comes to its devastating conclusion. The Inquiry chair rules that for decades residents were failed at every turn. The British Gas customers have been sent hundreds of extra bills by mistake. And more success at the Paralympics with Dame Sarah Storey bagging her 18th gold. Would you join me for those stories and more at 6.30? All going rather well, isn't it? Yeah, amazing. Well, from gold medal to bronze, bell metal now, as a Suffolk village welcomes the return of some rural reverberations. That's easy for you to say, a bit of alliteration <laughs> really. there. Uh, the bells are not St Clement's, but St Margaret's Church in West Thorpe near Stonemarket have been silent for around 100 years. But thanks to a community campaign and a National Lottery Heritage Fund grant, the Clangers, not those ones, uh, have been restored. Well, a dedication service has been taking place this evening and it's from there, Tanya Mercer reports. Good evening and welcome to the beautiful bell tower of St Margaret's. There have been bells here for 600 years, but in 1959 they fell silent. And in fact, there hasn't been a full peal ring out for more than 100 years. The bells themselves had fallen into disrepair and the bell frame itself was deemed to be unsafe. So after many years of silence in 2021, the village decided to come together to raise funds to restore the bells. And to tell us a little bit more about that is David. David, tell us why these bells are so special. And indeed, you have your own memories, don't you? I can remember as a small boy, the wonderful sound of the church bells, almost iconic across the countryside. And we have this fantastic historical connection with Mary Tudor, Queen of France, who lived at Westhorpe Hall, who actually worshipped in this very church 500 years ago. And it has been an awful lot of work. Tell me how they came to be restored. Well, we started fundraising locally. We were very fortunate that the Heritage Lottery came on board and things really swung into action. And we had this wonderful opportunity for the village that went in a coach up to Loughborough to watch the bells being recast and that was a, an iconic moment but again really it's just been an absolutely fantastic journey. David thank you and it has been a real labour of love. The bells came back here and were reinstalled in May. Well Clive is the tower captain. Good evening Clive. We've got six bells up here. They look fantastic, but there are three, aren't there, of note? That three special bells, three royal bells, three royal connections. We have this, the brand new bell is in remembering King Charles III and his coronation last year. And next to King Charles III, we have Queen Elizabeth, our, our queen, remembering her reign. And in the far corner there, we have our heritage bell that would have been cast in Bury St Edmunds in 1530. It is really, really special for the village, for the county of Suffolk, for people who will be coming to this evening from all over the county. Clive, thank you very much. Well, shortly the congregation will be gathering for that dedication service and they will be welcomed by these beautiful bells. And a little earlier on, we got a sneak preview just how they're sounding. That's a lovely sound, isn't it? Just what I was thinking. Just, just amazing. Climbing. And it's a real skill, isn't it, to do that as well? Mm, and you need the strength too. 
Ash, hello. Weather, it's felt a little different today. Maybe fresher, more autumnal? I thought it did, just this yeah. morning. No, there was a, just, a little, <laughs> just a little something in the air. But mm. actually, temperatures today were 21.5 degrees. It was still a beautiful day. Yes, there is some cloud around, and there's a couple of showers around at the moment as well. But yeah, it does, just something a little bit fresh. Yeah, but nice temperature, though. I mean, it's not, you know, but, it, but it's just going to creep up a bit more, isn't it? Yeah, so we just have a brief burst of some heat and some humidity as well. I'm just going to show you what's going on. So our jet stream, as we know, carries all of our weather systems across the Atlantic. But an unusual little feature happening, it's cutting itself off. So it's creating a circulation in the upper atmosphere. Here it is across parts of France and Spain. Portugal as well and what's what it's doing is circulating around all of that heat and humidity and also some moisture as well so there is still the possibility of some thundery downpours and just so down at the surface if you just cast your eyes across France you can see all these weather fronts caught up in that pattern so it is going to be briefly quite warm quite humid which I know you quite like as well oh, Lots of details. Likes that too. <laughs> Lots of details in the forecast <laughs> Greater Anglia sponsors ITV Anglia Weather. Well, it was fairly warm for most of us today. A little tiny freshness in the air, but this morning started off lovely. Always a little bit of cloud around first thing. We did actually have some mist and fog around as well, but for most of the day, it's been sunshine, a little bit of cloud, and there's been just an isolated shower too. But as we head through the rest of this evening and overnight, always the possibility of an isolated shower. Most of us though, it's a dry night, clear spells, and temperatures only dropping back to around 14 degrees Celsius. So it's already quite mild first thing tomorrow. Now Thursday is quite an interesting day of weather. Increasingly the humidity is going to climb through tomorrow. So the best of any sunshine in the morning. There's always the possibility of some showers running into parts of Essex. The further north you go, the drier it's going to be and the breeze is going to noticeably pick up as well. There may be some coastal mist and fog around as well, close to the coast through most of the day and temperatures getting up to around 20 degrees Celsius. Now here are your times of high water through tomorrow at South End. It's at 20 to 3 in the morning and then again at 10 to 3 tomorrow afternoon. So Thursday into Friday, it's to the southeast where we're looking for a weather, a low pressure centre spiralling across parts of Europe. So we're tapping into some warm continental air, but always the risk of some showers pushing northwards with this weather front here. Now at the moment, this is where we think it's going to sit, but there is actually a weather warning out for Friday. Some of those showers that are pushing in off the continent could be quite heavy and thundery. Further north you go, the drier it's going to be, but certainly increasing amounts of cloud noticeably warmer on Friday and more humid as well. Widely temperatures anywhere from around 23 to 24, possibly even 25 degrees Celsius and maybe even 26 degrees in one or two spots. But as we head through Friday, noticeably warmer, more humid. And then as we head through the weekend, there's going to be some showers around. Greater Anglia sponsors ITV Anglia Weather. So potentially some thunderstorms. Yeah, so they're, they're hit and miss with thunderstorms, but just indicating that, that heat and humidity. Let's hope they miss. Yeah. <laughs> Have a lovely evening. Take care. Bye-bye.